this war on worry. The day is coming when anxiety is going to be less. Peace is going to be greater. The day is coming in which there's going to be a sense of satisfaction in just what God has done for you. We have a passage that we're building this series on, Anxious for Nothing, and it's found in the book of Philippians. And we're just unpacking this passage this summer, one phrase at a time. The words are going to appear on the screen. If you'd like to say them with me, you can. In fact, if you know it by memory, I want to encourage you to close your eyes and give it a go. Let's all fill our lungs with air and our hearts with hope. Sit up straight. Say the words like you mean it. You ready? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are pure, whatever things are good, whatever things are true, whatever things are Anxiety. We thought it appropriate that we mention, make a word about the decision of the Supreme Court from this week regarding gay marriage. It seems like it has stirred many questions, and rightly so, and caused no short amount of anxiety. At Oak Hills, our commitment remains the same. Our doors are open to any person, any person from any background who is seeking God to find love, find hope, find eternal life. Our understanding of marriage has not changed. We see the biblical definition of marriage is one man, one woman for life, and that we will continue to teach and that we will continue to encourage. We encourage strong covenant-based marriages, marriages that are triangular in the sense of husband and wife and God. We believe that a marriage exists to help us understand who God is, to reveal more and more of the mystery of God. We do not believe that a marriage exists for our own comfort or satisfaction, but that there is something in a marriage that reveals the gospel itself. And so we're going to maintain that. We're going to continue teaching that. We're also going to continue leaning into our sovereign God and believing that everything works together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We're also reminding ourselves that we are citizens of heaven, first and foremost, and that we have made an allegiance to a king, and his name is Jesus Christ. We're pursuing peace. We're wanting to do all we can to create peace with all people. And during these changing times, we'll continue to hold on to the unchanging hand of God. Amen. And so, Lord, we pray. Amen. We do pray, Heavenly Father, right now, we just pray for our nation. We know that nations come and go and that your scripture says that they're all like dust in your palm. There there are so many of them that have come and gone since the beginning of time. We'll tell you, though, Lord, we love this nation. We really do. And we're so in debt to what you have done for us in this country. Our hearts are concerned, but we know yours is not. We know you're sovereign. We know your plan is perfect, and so we trust you. We beg you, have mercy on the leaders and decision makers of our country. Please, let thy kingdom come. Let thy will be done. Forgive our speaker today. His sins are too many to count. Help us to see Christ, just Christ. And through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Well, the widest river in the world is not the Mississippi, it's not the Amazon, it's not the Nile. 
The widest river in the world is a body of water called the River If Only. Millions of people stand on the banks of the If Only River, casting longing eyes across the water, thinking, If Only. And they're convinced that the good life is on the other side of the river. If only I were thinner, if only I were richer, if only I had that promotion, if only I were married to him, if only I were married to her, if only I weren't married at all, if only the kids would come, if only the kids would leave. Everything is just (laughs) one if only away. Is there an if only that's celebrating you from happiness? Is there an if only that today separates you from happiness? A promotion, an operation, an election, a pay raise. Are you thinking that if only that would happen, I would finally be happy? Well, if the answer is yes, we have just found one source of your anxiety. Because you've based your happiness on either a possession or a circumstance, neither of which is very reliable. But if you base your happiness on a possession or a circumstance, and if only, then you're going to focus on that possession and focus on that circumstance and do whatever it takes to get it, only to be disappointed when it can't deliver. And you end up in a cyclical thing of getting that promotion or getting that possession or getting that if only or changing your circumstance only to realize it didn't do what I thought it would, so I have to go after something else. And life becomes this rabbit trail hunt of one turn after another, happy, then disappointed, happy, then disappointed. (laughs) No wonder you're anxious. The Apostle Paul has a better idea. He suggests really that happiness happens not when circumstances change but when our attitude toward our circumstances does that happiness happens not when our circumstances change but when our attitude toward them our outlook toward them changes this is part of what he teaches us in this prescription for anxiety when he says be anxious for nothing But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Last week, we pointed out that the path to peace is paved with prayer. Say that sentence real fast. The path to peace is paved with prayer. Urgent prayer, careful prayer steady prayer as the apostle paul told the church in ephesus he said prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare so pray long and hard pray for your brothers and sisters every time worry raises its ugly head what do we do we pray it back we respond in prayer formal prayers spontaneous prayers prayers at school prayers at chapel prayers in a commute all types of prayers prayers over the cradle prayers at the table prayers in the kitchen we're always praying So anxiety is best treated with prayer, but not just any form of prayer. The apostle says this prayer needs to be sprinkled or sugared with gratitude, with thanksgiving, he says. As you pray, as you pray, offer prayers of thanksgiving. Anxiety is dealt with when we realize that even in bad times, things aren't as bad as we think they are. And gratitude causes us to remember that God has already made great provision for us. Gratitude takes us out of the off of the river bank of if only and leads us into the fertile valley of already. We go from if only to already. The anxious heart says, if only I had this. The grateful heart says, oh, I already have this. Inside your heart, there is a bucket, and this bucket is full of everything you need to cope with life. And sometimes you feel like that bucket is empty. And you go to God and you say, God, please fill my bucket. Gratitude happens when you look in that bucket and you say, oh, God has already given me things. He's already, I just thought it was empty. But look at all the things, look at all the blessings I already have. 
Can I invite you to look in your bucket for just a moment? I want you to think about all the good things that are going on right now in your life. This isn't a suggestion. This is a command from your preacher. (laughs) No, really, think for just a second. What are some wonderful things that are happening in your life? Just get them going in your mind. Maybe good health, family, children, spouse, a good job. What are some good things that are happening? Let that kind of settle down into your heart. And then look at your heart and realize what just happened. As gratitude increased, anxiety diminished, didn't it? When gratitude comes in, anxiety grabs his satchel and walks out the back door. Anxiety will not share a heart with gratitude. And gratitude always trumps anxiety. So the quickest way to deal with an anxious spirit is to treat it with gratitude. The quickest way out of the valley of anxiety is that little trail called, I am thankful. You can get out of anxiety more quickly than you ever imagined by learning to stop and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you have given to me. So our first point that we take out of this particular passage is treat each anxious thought with a grateful one. Treat each anxious thought with a grateful one. The Apostle Paul shows us how to do this. In that in the same letter of Philippians where we get the cure for anxiety, he gives us this call to contentment. He says, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. The apostle says, I've learned a secret. And the secret is how to be happy in every single situation. Now, remember, he's in a jail cell. He has no guarantee he's ever going to be released. And yet he says, I'm as happy as I can be. I have learned a secret. Wouldn't you like to know this secret? A secret by definition is something that not everybody else knows. Hmm, can I let you in on a secret? Would you like to learn the secret of contentment? Here it is. It comes to us in two phrases. Paul's secret of contentment included two ideas. First of all, his peace did not depend on upon possessions his peace did not depend upon possessions it couldn't be purchased it couldn't be parked in a garage he didn't have to pay a mortgage payment on it his peace did not depend upon a possession he said I've learned the secret of being satisfied with what the things I have I know how to live when I'm poor I know how to live when I have plenty does your happiness depend on what you drive does it depend upon what you wear Does it depend upon what you deposit? Does it depend upon what you spray on? If so, you're setting yourself up for anxiety because we all know that that what you drive, what you wear, what you deposit changes from day to day, from week to week. Heaven does not know you by what you own, so you shouldn't know you by what you own either. Jesus said, life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. Heaven does not look at you and say, oh, that's the family in the new house. Oh, look, that's that lady with the nice car. Heaven doesn't do that. Heaven looks at you. God looks down upon you and says, that's my child, my child in whom my spirit dwells, for whom Jesus Christ died. Heaven does not look upon you and think about the stuff you have. Why? Because this stuff is destined, destined for the trash bin, every bit of it. You've heard the story, perhaps, of the hillbilly who was invited to the rancher's mansion for a tour. When the hillbilly went into the rancher's mansion, he was just wide-eyed. He'd never seen any. He didn't even know how to act. He wasn't a real sophisticated guy. And as the rancher took him on a tour, showing him all these famous paintings and this old furniture and these beautiful fountains, that poor hillbilly didn't even know how to respond. Until one time they went into one room and the rancher said, oh, this is my favorite, favorite room. This furniture is so expensive and antique. I mean, it goes back to Louis the Fourteenth. And the hillbilly said, well, I can relate to that. My couch goes back to Sears on the 13th. <laughs> it all goes back eventually. 
It all goes back. Caskets do not come with safety deposit boxes. You don't take it with you. The jewelry, the clothing, it all stays here. So why would you make your peace dependent upon what you have? The Apostle Paul said, you know, I've learned to be equally happy when I have a lot and when I don't have much. This was his secret. His secret was that the list he considered was not a list of possessions, but a list of, list of gifts from God. His list included things like I'm forgiven by God, I'm known by God, I'm cherished by God, I'm eternally destined to be with God. That was his list. And no one could touch that list. Consequently, he was happy regardless from what he had. There's a second part of his secret And that is, his happiness did not depend on happenings. His happiness did not depend on a happening. Circumstances, whether good or bad, did not affect him. Because his happiness did not depend on a circumstance. They could put him in jail in Philippi. He'd still sing praises in the middle of the night. They could put him in jail in Rome, and he would just write letters that were still studying 2,000 years later. Nero could sentence him to death, and that was okay because, according to Paul, for me to live is Christ, and for me to die is even better. It's profit. It's gain. Circumstances could not take away his joy because circumstances could not take away his Christ. Circumstances could not take away his joy because circumstances could not take away his Christ. The apostle said this, to me, the only important thing about living is Christ. And dying is gain. I think that one verse summarizes the beautiful life of the apostle Paul more than any other. To me, the only important thing about living is Christ. And dying is benefit because I get to know him more. You talk about a beautiful worldview. Let's think for just a second. If that verse were written to describe your life, if you use that verse to describe your life, how would you fill in the blank? To me, the most important thing about living is what goes right there. To me, the most important thing, how would you fill in that blank? To me, the most important thing about living is my career. To me, the the most important thing about living is retirement. Uh, To me, the most important thing about living is is to be healthy. Uh, To me, the most important thing about living is, is my family. Now, I just listed off four things that are very good, right? A career, a family, to be healthy, retirement. Those are wonderful gifts. But we've all been around the block enough to know they can't sustain us. I mean, you can do your best to be healthy and still get sick. You can do your best to be retired and the economy still goes south. You can do your best to have a profession and still things happen. The Apostle Paul found satisfaction because he decided that the most important thing to him was knowing Jesus Christ. And that was the only untouchable thing treasure on the planet and so he set himself about this one task of knowing jesus christ then if those other things happened wonderful if they didn't happen that was okay because he was not counting upon them to do for him what only christ could do so he woke up every day thinking okay i've got another day to know more about christ to explore him to think about him to ponder him When he put his head on the pillow at night, he'd think, oh, I learned so much about Jesus today. I can't wait for tomorrow to learn more about Christ. And so ironically, the happiest person in Rome was not Nero in the palace, but the apostle Paul in the prison. Why? Because he set himself about the task of knowing Jesus Christ. And his circumstances could not take away his Christ. Christ was his fountain. Christ was his source. Christ was his identity. He didn't count on another person. He didn't count on an accomplishment. His whole being was wrapped up in knowing one thing, 
to know Jesus Christ. To me, he said, the most important thing is knowing Jesus Christ. I think the apostle Peter could have said the same thing. We're going to close this message by looking over at the day the apostle Peter decided to start following Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Just to remind you, Peter was a <coughs> excuse me, a follower of Christ before Paul because Peter met Jesus when Jesus was still on the earth. Paul met Jesus on the Damascus road after the after the resurrection. But Peter became a follower of Jesus Christ on the day that Peter had gone fishless the night before, which was an occupational hazard because Peter was a fisherman. He didn't fish for the fun of it. He fished to feed his family. But he'd gone all night without catching a single fish. They threw the net out into the water all night long, pulled in the net. They didn't even catch a minnow. That's a hard night for a fisherman. So he had his boats up on the beach. He had his nets out and he was cleaning them. And down the beach, Jesus began speaking. A crowd gathered around. And the crowd so pressed up against Christ, well, that Christ was backing into the water. So Jesus looked down the beach at Peter, who was cleaning the nets next to his boat, and said, can I borrow your boat for a minute? Peter said, yes. Pushed out into the water, Jesus climbed in, and Peter's boat became Jesus' pulpit, which was fine with Peter. Until after the sermon, when Jesus said, okay, Peter, let's go fish again, this time out into the deeper water. Peter did not want to go fish. Anybody want to speculate why? Well, he was tired. He'd been up all night. He knew that you caught the most fish at night when it was cool. He didn't want to be embarrassed in front of the people who would be watching. He had all kinds of reasons. He'd already cleaned the nets. He was ready to go home and, and get some sleep. But something in the way Jesus talked to him, something in what Jesus said, convinced Peter to try one more time. And Jesus heard Peter say, okay, if you say so, we will. And out they went. And no more had they cast their nets into the sea than what happened. They caught so many fish, they could barely get the fish into the boat. They had to wait for another boat to come, and they filled up the first boat, and then they filled up the next boat. They were up to their knees in fish. They were flush with fish. Fish were everywhere. Fish were all around them. This was huge. I listened to a lesson the other day from a preacher named Judah Smith. He raised the possibility this might have been the greatest catch in the history of the Galilean Sea. It for sure was the greatest catch in the history of Peter's life. This is the most fish he had ever caught. Suddenly, he had two boats full of fish. Can you imagine what he could have done with all those fish? I mean, he could sell all those fish and have some money in the bank. He could put a down payment on that pickup truck that he had been wanting to buy. He could take the wife on a vacation. He could buy her a little bling bling. I mean, suddenly he had some money. Not only that, if he could convince Jesus to join his fishing crew... I mean, that's like having Bill Gates as your buddy. I mean, that was guaranteed income. If he could get Jesus to come back and fish with them every day and work his little mojo on the water, then, boy, he would have income for life. All he had to do was convince Jesus to join up with him. But did you know that before he could ask Jesus to join up with him, you know what Jesus did? Does anybody already know? Jesus asked Peter and his brothers to follow him. Jesus looked at Peter and he said to Simon, there is nothing to fear. From now on, you'll be fishing for men and women. They pulled their boats up on the beach, left them, nets and all. And followed him. 
What did they see in Jesus that would cause them to turn their back, backs on two boats of fish? What did they see in Jesus that would cause them to, without hesitation, without any question, to say, boy, I'd much rather follow him than have all of them. That there's something about him. There's something about knowing him. There's something about walking in his shadow and following his steps. There is something about him that makes all of that the greatest catch in the history of our lives, the greatest catch perhaps in the history of the Sea of Galilee, guaranteed income. I would rather have moments with him than days and days of them. What did they see in Jesus? Boy, I'd love to find out. I believe that there is something in Jesus Christ. There is something about him that he has the ability of touching a person's life in such a deep and profound way that everything else, your greatest accomplishments, your greatest days on the sales force, your greatest promotion, that everything else suddenly seems like two boats full of dead fish compared to following him. I believe that Jesus Christ right now will give to you a satisfaction, a happiness, a joy, a peace that is deeper than anything you have ever imagined. I believe that he is a fountain of living water that will never be exhausted. I believe that he is a source of wisdom and strength that will never be expired. I believe that he has grace for every sin He has answers for every question, and he has an authenticity, a realness to him that can captivate your heart. I believe that he can do for you what no possession can do, what no promotion can do, what no election can do, what no circumstance can do. I believe he can. And I believe that's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, to me, the only thing worth living for is Jesus Christ. The only thing. I believe that's what Peter discovered. That the only thing worth living for was not more boats of fish, but it was something in the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about religion, folks. I'm not talking about a system of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. I'm talking about a living relationship with the living Jesus Christ. I'm talking about Jesus Christ, who I believe right now is seated on a throne in the deepest part of the universe, overseeing the affairs of the whole world, and that he is leading history to a wonderful outcome for those who cast their lot with him. I believe he is real. I believe he is good. I believe there is a devil who wants to interrupt. I believe he lies to you. I believe he's trying to sucker you and sucker me into short-term solutions for long-term problems. And he's trying to get us to base our happiness on circumstances and stuff. And he's selling lies. But right now, Jesus Christ says, I'm walking up and down the river of if only. And your happiness is not going to be found over there. But your ultimate real happiness is found in knowing me. I hope you find that prince charming. I really do. I hope you marry the perfect wife. I hope you do. I hope you get all the promotions. I really do. I hope you drive the car of your dreams. I really do. But I just want you to know that if you have those, they will not give you what you really want. They can't. No human being can give you what you want. They can try. But if you're counting on a wife, you're counting on a husband, or if you're counting on a friend, or counting on kids to meet the deepest need of your life, you're going to be disappointed. But if you count on Christ Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who was here before the world began, will be here long after this version of the world is gone, I promise you, dear child of God, you will connect with the reason you're on this earth and you will find something that will take care of you and sustain you for the rest of your life. Has anyone else found that to be true? If so, say amen. 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 Here it is in a sentence. What you have in Christ is greater than anything you don't have in life. 
What you have in Christ is greater than anything you don't have in life. May God give you everything in life. But listen to me. If he doesn't give you anything else in life than what you have, you have enough. You have enough for unbridled peace and unbridled happiness right now. It's yours. It's yours. Just make it your aim to know him. Be grateful, thankful for what you have, and let that gratitude say goodbye to your anxiety. Amen. Lord, please now help us to just receive this word, receive your teaching.